Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Holotube. So today um, we welcome Joao Benedonis, and um, he's going to tell us about the non-perturbative cosmological bootstrap or path there, there too. Take it away. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much for the for the invitation to talk here. It's quite an interesting experience to speak at the Holotube. So, uh, so yeah, today, so this, uh, I, it's going to be the first time I give this talk, and I want to tell you basically the story that took me to this problem of the cosmological bootstrap. So, as you will see, is not really the way I got here is not really coming from direct uh, cosmological motivations. It's more from an analogy. So, working on understanding quantum field theory and in the, and in the sitter space, in flat space. And now the question is what happens in the sitter space from a bootstrap uh, perspective, okay? So, so I want to start by giving a, a general discussion of, of that perspective. And then I will go into the actual uh, work in the sitter space that was based in this paper that I wrote with the um, Matthijs and Cameron, and uh, well, I should really uh, thank them for uh, the work they did because this was a very long project and really most of the work was really Cameron that kept pushing for uh, two years while I was mostly distracted with other things and very happy that we managed to get somewhere in this, uh, in this context. Okay, so, uh, so let me tell you the the big picture. So bootstrap is, if you want, uh, an approach to quantum field theory that is intrinsically non-perturbative because it just starts from some general principles. And from there, there are some bounds on the space of quantum field theories in terms of some physical observables. Okay, so this is very generic and it works in, uh, where it works for conformal field theory, that's where the biggest su success happens. But it also works for massive quantum field theory, as I want to emphasize today. And that's, that's basically the focus of today's is generic quantum field theory, not necessarily conformal. And uh, the picture is that you can do it in many different backgrounds. So here I put the backgrounds in this cosmological constant axis, if you want maximally symmetric backgrounds and kind of our understanding it's uh it's the opposite of the cosmological constant okay so in, in negative cosmological constant is where we know things better then in flat space more or less we know more or less the formulation but it's not as clean as in ABS and here in the sitter uh, it's much more open and that's what that's the focus of the talk today but I think it's useful to briefly review how these things are known and how they match together. So I will spend some time on that uh, in this introduction. And please in interrupt me if you have questions because really I, I don't know exactly what is the background. And uh, since this is not a very big audience, I think it's more effective if you interrupt me and I can adapt, complement some, some arguments if, if it's not clear what I'm saying. So let me start in the case we understand better, which is ABS, okay? So here, the trick or the basic fact that uh, makes this uh, very uh, under control is the existence of a boundary operator bulk state map, okay? So let me just explain this picture. So this is a picture of ABS. Here of ADS d plus one in Poincare coordinates. Okay, here I'm doing Euclidean ADS. D plus one. So you have a coordinate z from zero to infinity, and then you have this RD slices. And there is a map, well, a map, just a change of coordinates. There's another set of coordinates that shows the same space as a cylinder, right? As the field interior of this cylinder. 
And, uh, and the mark, map works in such a way that this uh, blue, this blue uh, hemisphere over here maps to constant time slices in the cylinder. And if you translate this blue, this constant time slices in time, so if you go, for example, to negative time, this hemisphere shrinks to the point B. Okay. So the point B, which is a point in the boundary here, just the center of Euclidean space at the boundary, is the point tau equals minus infinity. Okay. You can even write B uh, corresponds to tau equals minus infinity. So you see, this gives you uh, the standard constru geometric construction for a state operator map. However, here, similar but different from conform field theory, because here the operator lives at the boundary at the point B, that's the operator that prepares the state, and the state lives in the usual constant time slices um, of the cylinder, okay? So why is this so powerful? Because whenever you have a state operator map, you have a convergent operator product expansion. Okay, so this is what I'm giving you here. So in fact, you have two forms of this operator product expansion. Uh, one of them is, well, if you have a bulk field, you can expand it at small z, so close to the boundary. And this expansion will be convergent you, if you remember, it's always the same argument. So suppose you put the field phi here. Now the field phi inside the sphere creates a state on the sphere. So you expand the state in eigenstates and the dilatation. And that's nothing else than states created by local operators at the boundary. But this expansion in eigenstates is a convergent expansion in this other space. Therefore, this, uh, this, um, Field expansion close to the boundary is convergent. And in fact, it's not only convergent, it's also the definition of a boundary operator. Okay? So I, my boundary operators are defined by this uh, near field, near boundary expansion of the bulk field, okay? this extrapolate dictionary. And uh, once you have that, then uh, by the same state operator map, you get uh, a convergent OPE between the boundary operators. So you see, just by considering any quantum field theory in entity sitter space, you're already recovering the basic axioms of conformal field theory living at the boundary. Okay? So this is what I'm showing you here. So what I showed you in the previous slide was the OPE convergence, which of course, if you apply to the four point function, you get the usual uh, associativity, right? You can use you can write the four point function one, two, three, four by expanding one, two, or by expanding two, three. And you, the equality of these two channels is the basic uh, crossing equation. And then, of course, if the CF, if the quantum field theory you have in ABS is uh, unitary, so it's a healthy quantum field theory once you continue to Lorentz in time, then uh, um, you will get also the unitarity conditions on the boundary operators, which you can, um, the simplest context is just reality of OP coefficients and some unitarity bounds for the scaling dimension. Okay, so you see, QFT in ABS implies that there is a set of uh, observables, which are correlation functions of boundary operators that obey the CFT axioms. Okay? So this is, if you want the non-perturbative definition, of quantum field theory in ADS, or at least a sector looking just at asymptotic observables. And as you know very well, that's, that's the name of this channel. If you have gravity in the bulk, then uh, the only thing that changes is that you have one more special operator in this CFT at the boundary, which is the stress tensor. And it's special because it's conserved and the dimension is fixed. And it satisfies some more identities. So when you integrate P mu nu around the other operators, you, you get some specific um, variation, conformal variation of the other operators, like the order, order identity. Okay. 
So you see that for, for ADS, you can first set the quantum field in ADS, derive the conformal bootstrap, and then you say, what happens if I put just perturbative gravity? Well, you get a new operator to stress tensor. So it's kind of no brainer to say, well, then non perturbative quantum gravity is just CFT full fledged with T mu. Okay. So this is if you want a systematic path to derive or define quantum gravity in ADS as CFT. Okay. okay, any question about this? Okay, so this is the case we know better. So the next case is flat space. So in flat space, the analog of these boundary observables is the S matrix. And we also know the uh, analog of the principles. So you want, again, unitarity, which usually will be imposed on the partial waves. You want uh, Lorentz invariance. And then the, the most tricky part is uh, this one here. Well, these two kind of come together because you cannot get crossing symmetry without an LTC. Crossing symmetry is a statement that you can continue from one channel to the other, the same complex amplitude at different limits of the same complex amplitude correspond to different physical uh, processes in the ST and U channel. And um, well, we have some very reasonable expectation that all singularities are given by, uh, if you want, Landau diagrams, or sometimes called Mandelstam analyticity or Landau analyticity. But there is no full proof of that. Okay, there's some partial proof within quantum field theory of analyticity, um, some some partial analyticity, but not the full Landau analyticity. And uh, and if you want, that's why I say our understanding of the bootstrap formulation in flat space is not as clear as in the CFT case because here there is uh, still some open question. And, uh, but as in the CFT case, we know that if we add gravity, well, there is one more special particle that can appear as an external state, which is a spin two massless particle. And this particle is special because it, you must have scattering amplitudes obeying soft theorems. So that's the analog of the world identities for, for the CFT in ADS, for QFT in ADS. And uh, in this case, you have to worry about infrared divergences. So it's important that you are above four space time dimensions because otherwise scattering amplitude with gravitons don't really make sense. You need somehow some dressing and then it's still not well, not well understood what are the list of properties that dressed amplitudes must obey, okay? So you see, that's another disadvantage of going to flat space because in ADS, you can go to low dimension, there's no problem because it's a box, so you have infrared under control. Okay, but here we still can have a list. So now the question is what happens in the sitter? What happens if you study quantum field in the sitter? What is the right setup? Okay, so that's the question I want to discuss with you today. We made some progress, but there is huge, huge number of questions still open. And, uh, and if you want, we want to fill in this table, okay? So in the bootstrap, there is always this thing. You choose an observable, then you write the principles and what are the equations corresponding to those principles. And then you try to derive things from that. Okay? So here in, the, in ADS, the observable is four point function of boundary operators that the right observable to study. In flat space is two to two scattering amplitudes. I mean, of course you can generalize to more, but this is what in practice has been done in bootstrap studies, because both of these things are functions of two variables. In this case are the Mandelstam invariants, the Lorentz invariants of the scattering process. And in this case are the conformal cross ratios. And then there's some crossing, which is basically invariance and the permutations. Okay. It looks quite similar. And then the next step is the decomposition in the Hilbert space in irreducible representations of the symmetry group. 
So in the ADS case, you get conformal blocks because that's the symmetry group. The isometry group of ADS is the conformal group acting on the boundary. And in flat space, you get partial weights, just partial amplitudes. So you, you decompose in total angular momentum and total energy, center of mass energy. And then unitarity is a constraint on the expansion coefficients. Okay? So in CFT, it's just positivity because these guys have squares of OP coefficients. And, uh, and in scattering, these guys are bounded by unitarity probability of going from two particles to two particles. And okay, what I want to end up this talk is by filling up the, the table, the last column, okay? Any question? Okay, I should mention at least one slide about related work. There's a lot of work in uh, studying quantum field theory in the sitter and cosmological applications and much more than what I know. So here I put some list of references, definitely incomplete. Um, so I just want to mention, so there's something called cosmological bootstrap, which is mostly perturbative. So it's, it's uh, trying to systematize the way of computing Feynman diagrams in, uh, in the sitter space, and I mean, there's many groups working on that, like the group uh, from Amsterdam or from Cambridge. There's a lot, a lot of work on that. There's also work trying to translate all the technology for written diagrams that we know in Euclidean ADS to the sitter space. Okay, so here I mentioned some some of the most um, important works on that. And then, I mean, here I, it's really a complete list of references. Of course, there is the old story of trying to really do the CETER CFT in the, in the gravitational context, which I will not touch upon at all. Okay, so I will just be doing uh, QFT without gravity in the CETER today. Okay, so, so this is my apologetic slide because basically I have no references from here on. Okay, so this is where my introduction ends and, and my talk starts. If you have any question about the motivation or lack of motivation. Okay, let's then study quantum field theory in the sitter. So, first thing, what is the sitter? So, just a quick reminder. The sitter is just some hyperboloid that you embed in Minkowski space like that. So the isometry group is just a Lorentz group that preserves this hyperboloid. And, um, and what we will do is that, uh, well, there's many ways to choose coordinates on the sitter. Most of the time we will use this so-called conformal coordinates that cover only half of this hyperboloid, as I show here. So this eta, this, uh, conformal time, runs from minus infinity to zero, and eta equals zero is future infinity. Okay, so it's the last uh, surface, if you want, where all observers will end up. And uh, and the point the point that, that I want to emphasize here is that this isometry group acts just as the Euclidean conformal group in this final slice, RD, right? Eta equals zero is just RD, and, uh, and the Euclidean conformal group is just SO, D plus one, comma one. So that's, uh, that's the geometry. So now we want to put the quantum field theory here. So first thing will happen uh, is, well, this quantum field theory will have a Hilbert space, and the Hilbert space will have to represent this, um, this symmetry group. And therefore, it will break into irreducible representations of this symmetry group. Okay, so that's the first thing. The Hilbert space will be some direct sum of irreps. 
And uh, so let me just make some comments about uh, what is known about EREX of SOG plus one comma one. So, uh, so it's convenient to break this group into these two subgroups, SO1,1 and SOD. And then, so we associate delta with the, the generator of SO1,1 and this L with the, the spin of the SOD. And for simplicity, I will consider just totally symmetric traceless representations. So spin L fields, not mixed symmetry for simplicity. But uh, all this is discussed in the literature. And then the fact that you want unitary irreducible representation, so unitary in the sense that this group with this precise real form is realized by uh, the emission operator, well, by unitary operators and the algebra by emission operators, uh, implies that this delta cannot take arbitrary values. So, so here in the picture basically it summarizes what is known. So for L equals zero, for spin zero, uh, representations, you can have the principal series where delta is of the form d over two plus purely imaginary. So it's a complex number that has to lie precisely on this line. Then there's something called the complementary series where delta can live between d over two and d. And then there is the discrete series. Um, well, actually this discrete series is only for ADS2, so for d equal one. And then there is also a discrete series in d equal three. There is also a discrete series in higher d, but they do not correspond to uh, symmetric traceless operators. You need mixed symmetric tensors. So, so that's the story. So the difference is that in for L greater than one, the complementary series ends at d minus one instead of d. Okay, so this is something you need to keep in mind. We, we need to, to have a Hilbert space with this structure. So now let me tell you a bit more about these representations. So basically the only thing I will use is that we can build a basis for this EREPS where, well, you have the indices carrying the spin, but the main point is that uh, these are infinite dimensional EREPs, and so they are labeled. Each basis element can be labeled by a point x in R D. And this basis is particularly convenient because if you use this basis, each one of these states transforms under the isometry generators as a primary local operator. Okay? So that you would write like that. If you think that this is a local operator in a CFT, it has some transformation properties. Well, that's how this state transforms. So it's labeled by a point X and the transformations are here. Okay, so then you can use this basis to make a projector onto each EREP. So the main equation that we will use several times is that you can, is the equation here at the bottom, is that you can resolve the identity in this Hilbert space as a sum of projectors onto the different EREPs. So there will be the vacuum, and then there will be uh, a sum over spin and an integral over this delta, which is a label of the, of the EREP of these projectors that have this nice uh, form in this basis. And then, okay, here I just wrote the projectors in the principal series because that will be always present. And then depending on the model, you can have either reps or not. Okay, so sometimes we'll have discrete series, sometimes not. That's, yeah, we still don't know exactly when each rep appears, but principal series for sure are always there in, a, in any quantum field theory in, in the city. Uh, okay, so that's the, that's the, what I want to say about the Hilbert space. Now, what are the natural observables? Is there a question? Yeah, sorry, Joe, there seems to be a question in the chat. Yeah, please let go me, ahead. Let me remind people that you can just unmute yourselves and ask questions. Yeah, yeah, please. Because the question as it is written is like a minute ago. 
asking, can you explain that again? So I don't know what he was referring to. Yeah, if the person that wrote, maybe it's better if you can. Yeah, yeah, that's what I. Yeah. Okay, let's wait some seconds. Maybe he doesn't have audio or something. <laughs> Okay. okay. Yeah, please feel free to interrupt. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I really wait. prefer. So I. I it was a. Sorry, where was the question? Sorry, I, I did. I just a, missed that. There's a question on the chat, but if the person asking the question doesn't explain more what he meant, it's difficult. But I, I um, did the chat message go only to Joao because I didn't see. I don't see it. No, no, it's to everyone. It just says, "Can you explain that again?" <laughs> I, oh, okay. Let's keep going. And yeah. Is Daniel, when he wants to ask, uh, please just unmute. But Daniel is not you. No, no, he's not me. I was I was confused by that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But well, no, he's not. Ah, there's another Daniel. Yes. Okay. 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 Sorry. Okay. I will continue. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, what are the natural observables? Uh, of course, you have quantum field theory, so one natural observable is local uh, correlation functions, correlation functions of local operators. And, uh, and in the theater, there's something really nice that you might get worried, well, this is a time-dependence geometry, you start contracting, then you expand, what is really your one to compute? But there's something really nice that there is one state called the Bench-Davis vacuum, where everything that you want to compute in this state, you can just compute on a sphere. So you do an Euclidean sphere, like I'm showing here. So then quantum field theory there, like it's like statistical mechanics. You just do the path integral on this compact manifold. You compute local correlation functions. So, and then you analytic continue to, um, to the, the sitter just by sending this angle theta to it. Okay. So this is what I'm showing here at the bottom, this formula. I'm being a bit more precise because of course, once you are in real time, ordering of the operators matters. So if you really want the Whiteman function with the precise ordering that I'm showing here, t1 to 2 tn, this is what you should do. You order the epsilons, so the real part of the Euclidean time, and then the, the imaginary part can be anything. So this is the usual prescription to get a Whiteman function from Euclidean. So you order it like that before going fully Lorentzian. Okay, so so that's I think some point that for me it's very uh, what do you say? comforting. Like okay, we know what we're doing on the sphere. It's just another convention from the sphere. But what's remarkable is that in the sphere, there's no boundary, right? So if you just do things in Euclidean space, on the Euclidean sphere, uh, it's a bit difficult to set up a bootstrap because, I mean, if you study a four-point function on a sphere, it's a function, I think, of six variables, right? There's like six geodesic distances between four points. So it's a complete nightmare to treat such a function. But once you continue to the sitter, as I will explain, you can just go to the boundary of the sitter and you get a nice four-point function, which just depends on two conformal invariant cross ratios. Okay, so somehow this analytic continuation really allows you to define simpler observables than if you stay in the sphere uh, all the time. But anyway, so this is these are the observables you can compute. And uh, let me discuss one of them, the simplest one, the two-point function. Okay. Um, so let's do the two-point function of a scalar uh, operator in the in the sitter. So, well, in these coordinates, e and x, this uh, conformal coordinates, it's not entirely obvious, but if you use the original coordinates, you think of the hyperboloid of the sitter as an hyperboloid in Minkowski space, then it's clear that this only depends on one uh, invariant, which, well, it's related to geodesic distance, well, more directly related to causal distance, if you want, in, in the embedding space. Okay. So that's, that's just from symmetries. This is just a function of a single variable. 
And then the most interesting thing is if you use now this resolution of the identity of the Hilbert space. Okay? So this is the main thing that we're going to use is to insert the identity here to, to decompose this two-point function in the contribution of each E-rep in the Hilbert space. And okay, I'm just giving you the final formula, but let me just give you a few words. So this is, of course, the contribution from the vacuum. You can have some one-point function. Usually we set it to zero, but it can be there. Uh, the most interesting part is this part here. So the point is that I remind you, maybe I'll write that. So I remind you that this projector was written as an integral, uh, let's say, dy delta y delta y, okay? Where this delta y was a state that transformed like a primary operator in the boundary, like in, in, in Rd. So, so now you see, once you replace that in, you get like vacuum bulk filled with, with boundary operator. And so this kind of, this two-point function is fixed by conformal invariance. And so all the dependence on the positions goes into a universal function, which turns out to be just a free propagator of dimension delta. Yeah, in this case, the sum over spin drops out because I'm doing a scalar operator. So this has zero overlap with operators with spin, with states with spin. And, uh, and then the crucial point is that you get this twice, right? You get zero phi delta y, and then you get it again on this side. So you get a square. There is some coefficient which you don't know, but it forms a square. And so that's the spectral density and must be positive because it's a square. So this is the usual way you derive Chalon Lyman in, in, in flat space. In flat space, you just use the, the irreducible representations of the Poincare group. Here you use the, the respective irreducible representations of the uh, isometry group of the sigma. Okay. So, so that's the, the main uh, equation that follows from unitarity is that two point functions should have this representation with a positive spectral density. And okay, here I'm, I'm only writing the contribution from the principal series for simplicity. We shall see how that sometimes, yes, for simplicity. I will, I will explain that more. But... Okay, so another thing you can do still with the two-point function is to again connect with the sphere, okay? So this, it's not so crucial for what follows, but but we did it, and it's it's kind of a fun uh, formula. So I'm I'm just putting it in. So on the sphere, you can compute a two-point function, and the two-point function is still easy enough. It's just a function of the, um, if you want, the angle on the sphere. If you can think of that, so like that, this x being the cosine of the angle between the two vectors uh, on the sphere. And then any function on the sphere, scalar function on the sphere, can be expanded in uh, spherical harmonics, which in this case are just the appropriate Gegenbauer polynomials. And so this AJ contains all the information about this two point function. And now what you can do is to invert, right? You can write a formula for AJ as an integral of Gegenbauer's times the two point function. And this is fine. This works for integer j, right? It just uses the orthogonality of Gegenbauer polynomial. So what we did was to basically use the standard like frasa gribov techniques to massage this formula to, to obtain a formula that is valid for complex j, okay? to actually implement the analytic continuation in spin. And this is what I'm showing you here. So I don't, don't, doesn't matter the detail of the formula. The point is that the integral, so you change from one to minus one to one to infinity with some fixed kernel, which is explicitly analytic in J and, uh, and you integrate, I guess, to this continuity. Okay? Because this two point function is perfectly uh, real for X between minus one and one, but then there is a branch point uh, at 
one, and so it's generically all part of this continuity that uh, you can use here. And then if to connect with the previous formula, so you can start from this sum and uh, by doing the usual Sommerfeld Watson transform, transform the sum into an integral, and uh, you end up in the you end up in this formula that I I told you how to derive it from the Hilbert space decomposition with this relation. Okay, so so the spectral density is just the analytic continuation of uh, this expansion coefficients in Gagan bar polynomial. Okay, so this is, if you want, an explicit relation that you get using the sphere. Okay, but this will actually not be important for what follows. Okay, so um, so let me just give you two examples. So they they are a bit illustrative. So suppose you take a massive free boson with mass greater than d over two in units of the Zeta radius. So I write the mass like that, the dimensional as mass like that. Then the spectral density for the two point function of phi itself is just uh, delta function. Okay. It had to be, right? I told you that, uh, well, it's here. The spectral density is integrated against a free propagator. So since this is free, better be that rho is is a delta function so that you recover the free propagator. Okay, so that, that was more of a self consistency. But another more instructive example is if you consider a CFT in the bulk. Okay, so a CFT uh, can live in the sitter. Well, can for sure live on the Euclidean sphere. It's exactly conformal to, to the Euclidean plane. So we can put it on the sphere. And then I'll let it continue to the sitter. Moreover, the two point function is completely fixed by, by the fact that you have a CFT in the, in the bulk. So the two point function is just that, where this little delta is the bulk scaling dimension. Okay, so don't confuse with the previous deltas. This is just now the bulk field is also a primary operator of a CFT in the bulk. And then you can use our formulas to compute the spectral density. Here it is, it's not particularly simple, but you already learned something. So you see here that it has poles. So in this, in this variable delta that has to live in the principal series or, or complementary series, but it's bounded by unitarity in the system. You see that this integral has poles at delta plus integers. So in particular, if delta is less than the over two, show you here the, the integral, right? So in the delta complex plane, you're supposed to integrate here where d over two is the, the real part on the principal series. And now you will have poles at delta plus integers. So when delta is less than d over two, the first pole is on the wrong side. And so by continuity, what will happen is that when delta is less than the over two, you have to deform the contour and get some extra residue. And so that's exactly what the complementary series is. Okay. So you see that basically what I want to say is that uh, if you look here, from the mathematical perspective, principal series, oops, principal series is some support on this. This complementary series is something here, but in practice, in a specific physical theory, what we see is that indeed you have support over the entire principal series, but the complementary series, you just have a single isolated delta function, this extra residue that cross the, pole, the contour. Okay, so from experience, it looks like complementary series is more like single particle states in flat space that have some isolated mass. You don't have like a continuous a continuous spectrum of all possible values in the complementary series. Okay, any question? So this is this is the, the kind of structure you see in the two-point function. 
Um, okay, and now, just by analogy with uh, AVS and, and flat space, we want to define some asymptotic observables. So the natural thing to do in the sitter is to consider the late time expansion, right? So that's the only boundary you have is the future. So you take some operator in the bulk and you send this conformal time to zero. So we, you approach a point at future infinity. So you can write this expansion, this formal expansion. Notice that here I don't have any argument a priori for the convergence of this expansion, but at least as an asymptotic expansion, it makes sense. And now there's two things, two possibilities. So either, so let's consider a real bulk field, emission field. So either the boundary operators that appear here are also emission and therefore delta must be real or they must appear in pairs. Okay. So you will have delta and delta dagger where the dimensions can be complex, but they appear in pairs, delta and the, and the conjugate. Okay, so that's just what follows from reality. And now let's see, let's see how that looks in practice. So if you look at the two-point function, you can ask what happens in this limit. Suppose I take one, one argument eta one to infinity. So I should reproduce this kind of expansion inside the correlation function. Well, uh, it's easy to see that this invariant C goes to zero when eta one goes to zero. And this free propagator has this behavior at small C. There's a power series in C to the delta plus integers and another one in C to the D minus delta. So it's easy to recover the expansion in C, right? You have, so this is what I'm showing here. So you have this contour and then this row will have poles. So first of all, this row is symmetric in delta D minus delta. That's, that follows from just group, group theory. The, those two representations are equivalent. And now uh, what you want to do to recover the small C expansion, well, on this term, you want to deform the contour to the right. right? Because bigger real part gives smaller, right? It's psi to a bigger number, so it's a smaller contribution. Exactly like in the OP. So, so this is the one of the most important observation is that the spectrum of boundary operators corresponds to the poles that appear in the uh, spectral density. And these poles are generically complex. So as I said, they can be either real or appear in complex conjugate pairs, but they are not constrained by unitarity in any sense. They don't have to be in the principal series or complementary series. So this is something very crucial that one has to keep in mind whenever we discuss the sitter is that there is no state operator map. So states are bound by unitarity. They must be either principal series, complementary series, discrete series. Boundary operators are not bound by unitarity. They can have any complex dimension and um, they are just given by poles in this uh, spectral density. Okay. And that's what controls the late time expansion of correlation function. In fact, I, I drew here, so these two nearby poles are the delta functions you saw. Okay. In practice, the delta functions that appear in the free theory, as soon as you turn on interactions, they turn into near two nearby poles. Okay. And when the poles pinch the contour, that's the delta function of the free theory. So, so this, the free theory is not an exception, it's just a degenerate case of this generic picture that holds uh, give the boundary operators. Any questions? Okay, so, um, so now let me go to the main actor and then I'm going quite slow, but okay, I think I think I can converge. 
So now, by analogy, we're going to look at four point function of the boundary operators. Because this four point function by construction will be uh, conformal, will be will transform like a conformal uh, four point function. Okay, so so again, the basic trick is to insert the resolution of the identity, and uh, and as before, what you get is some. Density, okay. I will call this the partial wave coefficients and some expansion functions that, that carry. Any is there a question? And some expansion functions that carry all the space time dependence. Okay, so again, it's easy to do this in your heads. So if you insert this here, you will be led to this picture. And as I said, this state transforms like an operator of a CFT. So now you have one, one, two, plus this one, three. So you'll have three point functions. And you'll have a product of three point functions integrated over the common point. That's what a conformal partial wave is. Of course, this is the X dependence. In principle, there is a number in front of, of this o, o of X1, O of X2, delta Y. And I is just the square of that number. So unitarity again just implies positivity of this I. Okay. So the the game is always the same. You insert the resolution of the identity, and uh, you break the the observable into a kinematic function completely fixed by symmetry, and a dynamical set of coefficients, which for reflection symmetric. So in this case, this OO goes to OO. So this I is positive because it's a square. Okay, and now you, you run with this, right? So let me just give you an example before going into the more general bootstrap. So if you do again a free scalar in the sitter and you look at this, uh, Four-point function. So notice that for a free scalar in the sitter, you have O and O dagger. You have these two poles. Well, I showed them. I showed them here. These poles here. This one and this one. So there's there's a pair of operators for a local boundary operators for a given uh, field in the sitter. Um, well, that's the full correlation function. So this is. The part that exists at uh, when the x's are at separate points, but there's also some delta function contribution. Well, this one is just from the identity, but this one is also there. And actually, we showed that you really need both of them to get unitarity. If you forget about these contact terms that are, are really important to, to get positivity of the partial wave expansion. And then we also study what happens when you turn on interactions. So this I delta is not just the first term. There's a lambda correction and so on. So you, you can use that to compute small anomalous dimensions to, the, to some boundary operators, to actually some, some double, double twist boundary operators. But let me not go into that. I, I, I don't have time for that. OK. So that's the slogan, right? Now we have a four-point function that is crossing symmetric. We have some unitarity constraints, so we should be able to bootstrap. Okay, so let's do first the case, the simplest possible case. That's the case we actually studied uh, in the paper in, in, for the direct numerical uh, study. So just take the sitter two. So the boundary is just a line, two dimensional, the sitter. So the boundary is one dimensional. And let's analyze the four point function of operators of this type. So O dagger, O dagger. So that's a function of a single cross ratio. So this is a speciality of one D conformal field theory. There's only one cross ratio instead of two in, in two and higher. And then, of course, if you permute one and three, 
These are operators at the future, so they are space life related, so they commute. So the correlator must be invariant in the permutation of x1 with x3. So that gives you a crossing equation. You can, you can check that this is what you get in terms of the cross ratio z. And you can also do the game we did before of expanding, inserting here, inserting here the, the identity. And you get again uh, an expansion in partial waves psi, which are explicitly known in this case in terms of some hypergeometric functions, and some expansion coefficients, partial wave coefficients, which depend on the theory. So these are the unknowns, but they must be positive by any time. And um, so one, one novelty is that now I'm writing explicitly discrete series because in, in uh, the theta two, we need a discrete series. Okay, so here the both the principal series and discrete series are needed in general. So one has to take into account both of them. Okay, so that seems to be all we need to bootstrap, but there is a slight problem is that this integral over nu and this sum over n is not absolutely convergent. Okay, so this these partial waves they oscillate as you go to large nu and large n. So they are a bit like, it's a bit like a Fourier transform of a power this, that you're doing here. So, so they are convergent in the sense you, you can, and there's many ways to do it. You can, you can, for example, put e to the minus epsilon nu square as a regulator and then send epsilon to zero. So that will give you a finite answer in these integrals. But, um, but to do numerics, you want something that really is convergent so that you can implement some, uh, some numerical bootstrap. So what we did to, to solve this problem, and uh, actually I'm not sure this is the best solution. This is what we could think of, but I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of room for improvement here. We acted with a linear function. Okay? So we traded the Z dependence by a dependence on these parameters, gamma and sigma by just acting on these equations with a linear functional. So this helps because it makes the integrals convergent. See, the problem is that well, there's some kind of delta function or local contribution centered around z equals zero and z equal one from this non, not absolutely convergent nature of the integral. So this, for gamma and sigma big enough, this solves the problem. Well, it's a bit technical. So I, I will just show the slide and try to, to move on fast. But the point here is that in principle, it is possible. We, we have all we need to do the bootstrap conceptually. Now we need to be smart in technicalities, like what is the best implementation? We proposed one and I give you here an example of a bound just as a proof of concept that you can get some non-trivial, non-perturbative bound from these equations. But I claim this is definitely not optimal and we are trying to improve this, this setup, okay? So, so just briefly, so this is the equation you get by trading Z by these two parameters, gamma and sigma, by acting with the linear functional. And then let's take here an even simpler example, okay, very concrete so that you see how things work in practice. So just take O equal O dagger, just the same operator. And you can even fix the dimension to be just slightly, whatever, this number we chose a bit randomly. Then uh, if you choose the same operator, then there's only spin zero and N must be even. On the other hand, you have to pay the price that there's an extra term coming from the disconnected term because now you can have uh, o, o, where you didn't have O, O dagger at separate points. And, uh, and the question now is, can we derive bounds on these parameters, right? These parameters are the information about the theory, all the rest, maybe I should say that. So this is dynamical information, all the rest is kinematics. And we show that yes, so if you assume that I as support only for new greater than this. So I is zero in the principal series for new less than 8.5, whatever, this was a number that we needed. 
then this i2 tilde cannot be 2b. Okay? So this is if you want for an example of a bootstrap bound. But this, this set of numbers cannot take any possible value, any possible positive value. Right? You need a theory is defined by choosing these numbers to be positive and satisfying this equation for all values of gamma and sigma. And so that, that's the bootstrap problem is to find what are the solutions. In general, this is difficult because it's an infinite set of equations and an infinite set of variables. So we, we, we showed that at least we can exclude some solutions as a proof of concept. Okay. So that completes the table. So we claim that in the C term, is very similar to ADS. You also have four point functions of boundary operators, which now are just late time operators. They transform under conformal symmetry in the same way. So they are crossing invariant in the same way. The main difference is that here you have a sum over E reps, which are labeled by discrete set of deltas and some spins. While here you have an integral over the principal series and possibly a sum over discrete. Okay, here I'm just putting the principal series because that's the main qualitative difference. And the blocks are slightly different, but they are very closely related. So conformal partial weights are actually a linear combination of conformal blocks, conformal block plus the shadow. But, um, but the main difference is that really you have an integral over the principal series. And here, positivity of this set of numbers goes into positivity of this set of functions because now they are functions of a continuous variable living on the principal series. Okay, any questions before I list my open questions? So there are many. I list some of what I think are more important. I guess I have five here. This slide is a bit charged, but okay. Let's let me go in step, maybe a few seconds on each question. So I think this one is the most important. It's like the most urgent, not important, most urgent. So so I told you that the Hilbert space must decompose into E Rex, but which E Rex? This is, uh, is crucial to know if you want to bootstrap, it's important to know, do really all appear, some not appear, and, and, uh, and this only with experience, right? You can ask the same thing in flat space. Uh, representation theory just tells you that the reducible representations of the Poincare group are labeled by a mass and a spin, right? The two Casimirs, related to the two Casimirs. In, in four dimensions. Okay. Um, but it doesn't tell you that the spectrum has to have some single particle states and then starting from 2m, where m is the mass of the lightest particle, you will have a continuum, right? This is physics. So I think we don't know the analog, or at least I don't know the analog of this physics in the sitter. What is, I think, Principal series is more or less like the continuum from 2m to infinity. It will always be there. And complementary series, it feels like that there might be there or not. Depends on the nature of, on the nature of the theory. If you have some state in complementary series. And if you have, it will usually be some discrete set of states. But that's an open question. But I think it's a question that can be answered at least in several, in a big class of computable examples. So you can take three theories. Three theories are a bit degenerate, but then you can do small deformations, okay? Turn weak coupling and try to understand the full Hilbert space. This looks trivial, but it's, I don't think even for the three theories done because what people usually do is study the single particle spectrum of the three theory. But the multi-particle spectrum, you need to do tensor products of these reps in, um, in the SOD plus one comma one. And this is not fully understood. So, I mean, it's a solver problem, but it's an open problem. And another case is if you do CFT, because both CFT 
we know the full spectrum in terms of CFT multiplets of the group S of D plus one comma two, right? It's a CFT D plus one. And again, we can consider small deformations in, uh, in the conformal perturbation theory if you want. And the same question goes for boundary operators. Okay, so in these examples, what is the actual set of boundary operators? Okay, so this question I'll be, yeah, what are the questions? What are the right questions? This is probably more for cosmologists to tell us what are the right questions. As you saw, the boundary derived was very contrived. So this is definitely not a particularly physically motivated question. So it will be interesting to have a, a discussion on that. Then better methods. So what we did again doesn't look optimal. For example, there is a formulation where you use six J symbols to write crossing directly in terms of I's without ever referring to, to the space time positions of, uh, of the four point function. So this looks like an eigenvalue equation, right? That I is a eigenfunction of this kernel with eigenvalue one. And so you need to find positive functions that are eigenfunctions of this kernel with eigenvalue one. Maybe this is a best way, a better way to think about this bootstrap problem. We, we didn't manage to make it work in practice because this function is quite complicated, this 6J symbol. The other thing that I think it's worth understanding is the flat space limit. So here, going from ADS to Minkowski, there's plenty of papers, some of them written by me, but many other people worked on this, on uh, taking this zero radius limit. So you, you focus on the tangent space of a point in ADS. So the same should be possible starting from the sitter. So how, how does this work? And of course, okay, that's the final question. <laughs> If you put gravity, can we, is just a small variation of this or not? I think there's very strong arguments that it's not because, uh, well, the sitter has finite entropy in, in the gravitational context. So in some sense, it's expected to be dual to a Hilbert space, to a finite dimensional Hilbert space, which is completely different from what we're seeing here in quantum field theory. But still, I think it's worth trying to pursue this and, uh, and understanding how this fails in this more direct line. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, so we should start by uh, asking for questions. Martin. Yes, um, thank you very much for this very nice talk, which I really enjoyed. Uh, I've got a question because at some points you already mentioned it during your talk that um, also the discrete series can show up like in uh, DS2, but also in higher dimensions for larger values of L. Um, but you never mentioned it when you wrote down like the four point functions and your uh, say how you reduce it then. Um, so, so what is their interpretation? And do you think they are important in this context of the sitter or not? Well, the, the, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, I mean, what I'm trying to say here is that if you have discrete series, well, you'll have one more term here, right? Sum over discrete series. So it, it will not change the, the logic. Um, but that's why I think this first question is so urgent to know exactly when you really need to put it and when you don't need to put it. So in, in 1D CFT, so in, in the sitter two, which then gives you boundary observables in one DCFT. Um, we know that this is really a complete basis. To have a complete basis, you need to include the silver. So this right here, yes. To include this discrete series. Uh, while in, uh, in, in higher D, uh, just 
Yeah, if you look at the papers on uh, harmonic analysis, so for example, well, the, the most recent paper is by David Tamman Duck and Petr Kravchuk and, uh, and Dennis Karatev. From a more harmonic analysis, the, the basis is just some over spin and integral over the principal series. So that's why we suspect this is enough. But, um, but I, what I would really like, and actually there was one very nice paper today, which I still didn't fully absorb about this representation of, SO, of the, the theta group, is to have a physical picture of what are these states. Because principal series, we have at least for free scalars, we, we see the single particle states. If, if the mass is above d over two, the single particle states fall into this principal series. But I don't know an actual quantum field theory which will give me these discrete states in the theta two. And I, I think this would be extremely useful to develop an intuition of when these things appear and say something. So. So yeah, that's my first open question is your question, if you want. So what we try to emphasize is that doesn't really matter for the logic is the same, but we, of course we need to clarify it before we do it in practice numerically. Did, did I answer your question? Yes, thanks. Are there any more questions? There were some already during the talk. All right. I know Martin always has another question. <laughs> yes, you can read my mind, to be honest. Um, but this was a, is a bit more technical question. So um, in this example for the free scalar field, which we now see also on your slide, um, you said you have two ultra local um, contributions like this delta functions, um, one of which you really need for unitarity. Um, but OK. Coming like from uh, say a more applied side, uh, these uh, these ultra local terms are usually scheme dependent. So should I be worried uh, that I really, if I do it for an interacting field theory, I first have to uh, fix my my scheme and uh, that unitarity depends on the scheme, or is it clear that it's completely independent of that? Um... Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I don't like these terms, to be honest. They were really a pain. Um, yeah, so one way to see them is if you take the limit starting from the bulk. Well, OK, so some first comment is that, so yeah, let me write this. So O of x1. O dagger of x2. So here you see the dimension delta O plus delta O conjugate is exactly D. So that's why you are allowed to write here a delta function, right? It's compatible with a, a D dimensional delta function, right? This is compatible with conformal invariance. So that's, that's just one check. But the point is that if you start from the bulk, you put phi of eta x1, phi of eta x2, and then you, you send them, um, sorry, this is, I have to, I have to be careful here. So phi, I told you as an expansion, as eta or minus eta to the delta times O of x1, but it also has the other term because it's, it's a pair of points, right? So delta conjugate O dagger of X1. And similar for the other guy. So of course you will have, so now as you send eta, eta to zero, you will have O, o plus O dagger O dagger plus O, o dagger, right? The, all the terms and the cross term. So yeah, what I'm trying to say is that if you do, if you take this limit at separate points, you only see that and that. 
But if you do it very carefully, in the sense that you consider positions x1 minus x2, which are of the order of eta, you see that there is always something that remains and that forms a delta function. So if you, if you follow these two point function as eta goes to zero, you see that it forms the, these things at finite distance, but there is something at the origin that picks up and really forms a delta function. So if you want, we have a regulated version of this delta function from the bulk that at least for, to me personally increases the confidence. And that together with the fact that we need it to get unitarity because if you forget about them, the, you just get negative in the composition, which is incompatible with unitarity. So, so that's why I accept this after many discussions with Cameron telling me we need the delta functions. And I was like, delta functions are not good, but uh, I, think, I think here they are really important. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you very much, uh, Joe, for the talk and for the discussion, for the answering the questions during the talk and after. Um, My pleasure. We can stay on as usual a little bit afterwards if there's anything and anybody wants to chat about. Um, and um, for now, I'll just uh, thank you again um, and stop the recording.